Hi everybody, welcome to Unit 2 of the Bio 193A online microbiology course. And the Unit 2 is about characterizing bacteria by colony morphology and staining. And some of the material in this unit of the lab is going to overlap with what you studied in week one in lecture. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about culture and we uh, when we discussed aseptic technique last week, we talked about culture media, inoculation, inoculum, uh, a culture which is microbes basically growing in a culture medium or on a culture medium. And I just want to add to that that culture media, so where we culture microbes, particularly bacteria, in the lab can be either liquid, and we call it a broth, or a solid, you should call it an agar. And the difference is basically the presence or not of agar. So agar is a, um, a material, it's a polysaccharide derived from seaweed. And it makes the, um, so when it's uh, warm, hot, I would say, then it melts and it's liquid and can be poured into tubes, plates, etc. But when it cools down to room temperature, or actually a little bit warmer, I think it cools down around 40 Celsius degrees, then it becomes solid. And um, we are going to see why would you use sometimes a liquid medium versus a solid medium. But we are going to talk mainly about Petri dishes, which are this flat uh, so a container that provides a flat surface for bacteria to grow. Um, composition wise, so regarding what makes a uh, culture medium, we can differentiate between chemically defined and complex media. And in lecture, there will be a whole chapter dedicated to how bacteria grow and what kind of uh, material substances and conditions are necessary for their growth. But in the, in the composition, sometimes you know exactly what is in that culture media. So chemically defined is that you're going to find a list of ingredients, you know, salts, vitamins, fats, etc., that make up this medium. And um, complex media are much simpler, <laughs> which sounds uh, counterintuitive, but these are much cheaper media, usually just include some kind of source of protein and maybe additional nutrients. So it could be, you know, extracts or digest of yeast, meat or plant. And the one of the most commonly used um, complex media is what we call NB nutrient broth and NA nutrient tagger. And there are special kind of media, which is when we are culturing microbes that cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. So these media are going to contain chemicals that are able to trap any oxygen in the medium, and that's uh, how it can provide an anaerobic environment. And this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of a chemically defined versus a complex medium. As you can see, to the left, everything is some kind of chemical ingredient. And on the right, you can see uh, beef extract and also peptone, which is a partially digested protein. So again, anything that has a name of lysate or extract or you know, partial digest of something that's going to be a complex medium. Okay, so let's talk about the different kinds of media regarding either solid or liquid and also their shape. So in the diagram, you can see to the right, we've been talking about Petri dishes. Um, so these are plates which have a large area, large surface area, in which you can grow bacteria. And these are useful to isolating bacteria, but also to observe bacteria. Then um, to the left, you have slants and deeps. Slants and deeps are both uh, made of solid medium, so they are going to be... Um, they were going to contain agar, but you can see that in the deep, it's almost like a, a tube 
filled with this medium and then it's solid while in the slant when this medium has been poured liquid then it's allowed to uh, to solidify at the slant so that way you are going to have a larger surface that you would have in the presence of the deep um, why would you use a slant it is kind of nice for the bacteria to have a little bit more surface to grow you know think about like the petri dishes it also provides surface but from a practical point of view they are much easier to store you know you just stand those tubes in a rack and they occupy much less space compared to a big rack of petri dishes um, the deeps are mainly used for bacteria that prefer not to be in the presence of oxygen. Okay, so especially anaerobic bacteria are going to grow very well at the very bottom of the tube because there is very little oxygen that can penetrate all the way. Um, broth or liquid, um, liquid medium, and this is what you use when you need a large quantity of bacteria so if you think about both in pharmaceutical industry or even in food preparation when you are fermenting or growing a large quantity of bacteria you usually do this in a fermentation tank so these are large scale containers that uh, contain a large volume of broth so that means that you can culture up a lot of bacteria at the same time and that little tube that you see durham tube we are going to talk more when we get there um, to the fermentation part so this is a little tube that allows to capture any gas produced and it helps us to um, identify or classify the type of fermentation that bacteria do okay so i want to talk briefly about the word morphology so morphology refers to the appearance, the shape of something. Um, so these are how do you describe the external appearance of something. And you're going to hear morphology relationship to colonies, but also in relationship to cells. So colony morphology is the appearance of colonies. So on the plate, you will see little dots of bacteria growing, and this is what we call a colony. Supposedly, each colony is a clone of cells coming from one cell, and they are going to grow in very um, interesting patterns. And the description of the colony can be very indicative, uh, or the appearance of the colony can be very indicative of the kind of uh, bacterium it is. So what are the aspects we are looking at when looking at color morphology? Well, the form in general. So it can be punctiform, which means that they are tiny little dots. It can be circular. It can be filamentous, which is, looks very similar to rhizoid. So they have filaments coming out, but in the filamentous, it's all filaments. While in the rhizoid, you have a little bit more solid center. And from there, you have some filaments coming out. And then irregular spindle, it's kind of um, obvious when you look at the shape. Elevation is the elevation of the colony. And when you are looking at colonies in real life, then you, you have to kind of look a little bit sideways at the plate. And um, some of them can have very interesting shapes like ambonate or crateriform, but I would say that the majority of colonies that you will see in a normal lab are going to be either raised or convex. And last but not least, the margin. So in the margin, we are not looking at the shape of the whole colony, we are only looking at the margin. And again, I would say most of the colonies you will see in a normal uh, microbiology lab are going to be circular with an entire margin. But sometimes you may see the undulate, lobate, etc. And if you're going to have a, uh, you know, some kind of filamentous colony, probably chances are that the margin is going to be filamentous. So again, there are many shapes of colonies, but the most common one are going to be pretty um, 
you know, normal looking, mostly circular, sometimes filamentous, and usually with an entire margin. And here are a few examples, and to the left you can see um, some irregular, many, you know, circular columns with the entire margin. To the right you can see a little bit of irregular lobed one. And also something I didn't mention before, you want also to uh, describe the color of the colony. So depending on the colony, depending on the bacterium, they may produce some pigments along the way. And some colonies can have very beautiful colors, like you can see on the right-hand side. Um, there is also um, a way to describe the growth patterns. And I truly recommend that you watch the video because it's going to be much nicer than this very simple diagram. But um, in the broth, for example, if you inoculate a broth, the left one is uninoculated, so it has nothing in it, sometimes the bacteria are going to grow very close to the surface in what is called the pellicle. And if you see a pellicle, that's a pretty good indication that your bacterium is aerobic, which means that it requires oxygen. You know, if you look at the next to last pattern, which is turbid, um, or flocculent. Floc the, the difference between turbidity and flocculence is that turbid one is cloudy and the flocculent would have kind of, um, um, how you say that, like little clots in it. So imagine some kind of like cottage cheese like, so thicker um, particles inside the broth. So when you see turbidity or flocculency that's pretty much tells you that the bacterium is happy anywhere. It's, it's happy close to the air, it's happy deeper down. But if it's in the pellicle, that means that it usually requires oxygen. And the opposite, if it's a sediment, probably doesn't like oxygen that much, so it kind of grows on the, in the bottom of the, of the broth. Um, the next section is going to be slant. So remember that slant was the, so when we poured in a tube, the, uh, the liquid media, the liquid, the melted solid medium, which is liquid, and then you let it um, solidify on a slant. So that's why you have the surface. So you'll be able to observe a little bit more complex um, patterns from, you know, filiform, it just means that you have very small, little like a thread-like um, aspect or borescent. It's going to be kind of branching like a tree, bedded would be more like tiny spots, rhizoid has like a root-like appearance and, and so on. Or you can have simply in a fuse, which means that the bacteria grow all over the surface. Okay, so um, what you see on the right hand side, it's a picture of two deeps. And the way you inoculate deeps, you take a needle and then you stab the needle into your agar. And the bacterium starts growing and then it can do two things. On the left, you see a bacterium that grew exactly where it arrived. So you can actually see where the needle came in. It grows by the stab. On the right, you see a bacterium that was able to grow and move away from the stab and basically fill out the whole deep. And what this indicates is motility. So some bacteria um, if you recall the, uh, the different parts of the cell of the bacteria, some of them have flagella, and that allows them to move. And to the right, the bacteria on the right are able to move, so that is a positive test for motility. While the bacteria on the left, they are unable to move from the stab, so that in indicates that they are non-motile. Okay, I'm not going to go through this part. We talked about this in the lecture in the, in the first, um, first week of 
class about the microscope. We have um, all kinds of videos and all kinds, and when you have the lobster lab also to go over the, uh, the parts of the microscope. So just remember that there is a path of light that goes from the illuminator, so that's your source of light, goes through the um, condenser, which is a set of lenses that the name indicate, the kind of focuses the light into a cone. You have an iris diaphragm, which on the name indicates it's a uh, basic an opening that can be smaller or larger to allow more or less light through it. Then it goes through the specimen, which is going to be on a slide, which is placed on the stage. And then it goes through lenses. This The first set of lenses is called the objective lenses, which have a number of different magnifications, and then through another set of, of uh, mirrors in, and prisms, it goes to the next set of lenses, which are the ocular lenses, and those are the lenses which are in the eyepiece, and from then it goes into, uh, the, you know, into your view. Um, some additional parts of the microscope are the focusing knobs. There are two knobs, the rough and the fine. The rough is mainly to move the stage up and down when you start and when you finish, and then the fine one is for focusing. And you also have knobs for moving the stage, so you don't yank the stage with your hands, you move the knobs and that's going to move the stages. So I think I have, um, you know, mentioned all the parts of the microscope. Be sure that you are able to recognize them in a diagram or in a picture and also that you know what part is, uh, what's the use of each part. Okay, so also in the, in the lecture we mentioned compound light microscopy, so this is the most common uh, microscopy, so you're using visible light uh, to to observe the specimens, and then remember there were two sets of lenses, the objective lenses and the ocular lenses, and the total magnification is going to be a multiplication of those two numbers. So for example, if you are using your so-called high-dry lens, which would be the 40x, ocular lenses tend to be 10x, so you're going to use a 400x magnification. Resolution is the ability of the lenses to distinguish two points, so the higher the resolution, the clearer the picture. And parfocal only uh, means that it's easier to focus with the microscope, and I would say most microscopes these days are parfocal. So when you are using, when you're focusing on a microscope, you always start with the lowest magnification, so that would be your 4x or 10x um, objective lens, depending on the type of microscope, and you focus on that one, and when you move to the next one, it's going to be, the focus is going to be very close, so you just need a minor adjustment of, of the focus, the fine focus knob to move to the next one. You, you never start with the highest magnification, it's extremely difficult to, to focus that way. Okay, um, something to remember, and the microscopy uh, simulation makes a good job of reminding you on that, is um, the special case of the oil immersion lens. So your oil lens is a 100x objective lens, and the special thing is that you need to put a big drop of oil between the lens and the specimen, so there is no air when the light crosses between the glass and the specimen on the glass and the glass of the objective lens. And the reason for that is that when the light goes from one substance into another, let's say from glass to air, it bends, and that's called refraction. And the bending of the light is pretty large when you are moving between glass and um, and air. So to minimize the bending, you put this immersion oil in between and the refractive index of oil is very similar to glass, which means that it's going to 
go almost straight from, I mean, you can see it in the diagram, it's, it's going to go almost straight without scattering, without bending um, outside. The one thing I was going to, to say is that in the lobster simulation, it makes you wipe the, so you have a slide and you have your three samples side by side on the same slide. And it says that you are supposed to focus on one, on the oil, and then you're supposed to wipe and then start all over again. That's not how we do it in real life. If you already focused on one in the oil, you just put oil on the rest of the sample, just slide uh, sideways. But um, if you are changing slides, then probably you need to do to do that. So one thing about oil immersion is it's a it's a messy business, and um, if you are in a real lab, you have to be very careful or wipe your lenses with lens paper, not Kleenex, not paper towels. It has to be special lens paper because otherwise you can scratch the lenses. Okay, so now we are going to move into cell morphology. Remember how I said morphology is regarding the appearance? Well, um, we looked at colony morphology before. Now we are going to look at cell morphology. Cells in general, with few exceptions, individual cells tend to be colorless. So stainings are going to increase the contrast between the cell and the background, and that makes observation easier. And there are also certain stainings that allow you to differentiate microbes or to see some structures better. In order to stain, you need to prepare the cells so they are easy to stain. So you will do what is called a smear. So in a smear, you take with a loop usually a little bit of the cells and you smear them on a slide to create a thin solution, a thin film of microbes on the slide. You attach it to the slide, so you spread it on the slide and you let it dry. But if you start staining or washing the slide, those microbes are going to come off. So you need to do something that's called a fixation. So fixing the smear means that um, you will be attaching those cells to the slide. And as a bonus, you're also killing the cells, which is a good thing, especially if you're handling um, pathogenic, dangerous microbes. How is fixing done? It's usually uh, using flame, alcohol, and when I say flame, it, it can also be heat. So in, I would say, most teaching labs, you just flame your slide by passing it. Uh, you fix your slide by flaming the slide, not flaming like you would sterilize something. You just pass it through the flame really quick for the heat, but in the lapser simulation, they ask you to put it on a... Um, on a heat pad, and then it's going to do the same thing. Okay, so um, the type of stains. So again, why do we are staining cells? Because we want to observe them, but sometimes we want to classify them or we want to observe certain structures. So the simple stain, as it says, it only requires one stain, and it's usually for when you want to just look at the cells, usually when you have a simple, a single cell population and you want to observe their, their shape, their arrangement, and so on. And most of the stains used in microbiology are going to work. So I put a few examples of that. Differential stains will um, distinguish between bacteria, and the two most important ones are gram stain and acid fast stain. And then you have special stains that are used to visualize certain structures. So flagella, capsule, and endospore stains are examples of that. Okay, so the labs or simulation does a really, really good job of walking you through the, uh, the reasons of the gram staining or what, what's the basis on having positive and negative uh, bacteria for gram staining. And it has to do with the cell wall. 
You may recall that bacteria have a peptidoglycan cell wall, but there are two groups of bacteria, and in one of them, the, uh, and I'm going to start with the bottom here, the gram-positive ones, you have the cell membrane, and then on top of it, you have this very thick peptidoglycan layer. And in addition to the peptidoglycan, there are also some additional substances uh, such as takeaway acids. In the other group, which is the gram-negatives, which is the one here on the top, you see that there is a uh, the cell membrane on the bottom, which is not part of the cell wall, and then the peptidoglycan layer is actually very thin, but on top of it you have one more uh, membrane, which is called the outer layer. And the outer layer is very fatty. The main component is LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and it is responsible for many of the functions or many of the aspects that makes gram-negative infections actually more difficult to treat. Okay, so, and, and this is something that you know, as I was saying, follow the laughter simulation. It really walks you through step by step both the uh, theory of the gram staining and the steps of the gram staining. So these are the steps. You're going to have a primary stain, which is crystal violet. All the cells are going to stain purple. Then you add what is called a mordant. So the iodine is is going to help setting the stain. It attaches to the crystal violet and forms these big complexes that kind of um, are attached to the cell wall. Then you add a decolorizer, and the decolorizer is alcohol, and that's where the difference happens. The in the case of the gram positives, the crystal violet remains attached to the peptidoglycan. But in the case of the uh, gram-negative bacteria, because that outer layer is fatty, it kind of goes away with the alcohol, and that allows the crystal violet to, uh, to leak out. Um, note that when you do the steps, you usually have to make quick rinses of water in between. Okay, so usually any between the... For example, the primary stain and the iodine and before and after the ethanol, you are going to have quick rinses with water just to eliminate any extra solution. The last step is what we call the counter stain. So this is just to make the empty cells, so the, uh, the gram negatives are not colorless because the crystal violet left, so you add saffron in, in order to have a color which is going to be pink um, in contrast to the purple. Of the gram positives. Okay, so quickly about special stains. We have the acid fast stains, which is used for a certain two groups of bacteria, which are called the acid fast organisms. So it's mainly my mycobacterium and nocardium. It's not uh, in this slide. And when we study about cell walls, special cell walls, we are going to learn that acid-fast cell walls have a waxy character to it. So in, it, it's harder to stain those cells. So the, uh, the primary stain here is, is carbofushin, which is a lipid-soluble substance that contains phenol. Phenol is, is a, a very nasty organic solvent, so usually when we do acid-fast staining, we should have ventilation in the lab. And there are different kinds of acid-fast staining. Uh, sometimes, you very commonly, you need heat to help the, the entering of the... Uh, of the carbofushin, sometimes you don't need heat. There are variations to the staining. The decolorizer is also different. You use something called acid alcohol. So this is a little bit rougher decolorizer. So acid fast organisms, because they have this waxy, more resistant cell wall, they, they will retain the carbofushin, but that's not going to be the case for everything else. And the counter stain is methylene blue. So whatever is positive is going to be 
kind of hot pink fuchsia kind of color and then everything else is uh, blue so the acid fast negative cells are blue flagella stain is as the name indicates in order to visualize um, flagella and it is they are very very thin clearly they are very microscopic even more because they are very hard to see under the bright field microscope so in this case there is a special um, staining which allows them to be visualized um, then we have capsule and endospore stain so to the left you can see the staining that you see this little dark cell surrounded by like a white um, ghosty uh, layer and that's the capsule so capsule is an extra layer that some bacteria have and in this case so you are staining and crystal violet is what you are seeing here so the crystal violet is staining the cell so the cells are the little dark spots but then the capsule remains uh, colorless so it again it's it's a way to um, to visualize the bacteria that have capsules outside um, endospore is a home um, it, it's a very interesting structure so certain gram positive bacteria produce endospores which are kind of a uh, survival capsules of the cell so if there is no food or the um, environmental conditions are very rough then the cells basically disintegrate but before they do that they pack their dna and a few you know emergency supplies into this capsule into these spores and these are you know spores can survive thousands of years bioterrorists use it like anthrax uh, bacillus anthracis makes spores and you know it's a powder and it can be inhaled it can be you know spread very easily so um what you see in the diagram is the green are the endospores and you can see that in this case they are still being formed inside the cells sometimes you can see them outside once the the red so the red are the the normal cells we call them also vegetative cells so in this particular diagram you're saying the endospore was part of the uh, of the uh, of the cell when they are still being formed and uh, this is actually from the lecture book on even if you're only in lab remember that you can access the lecture book it's a free book and then you can see some more examples of these stains and their application so this is the ending of the um, of uni 2 lecture thank you